and welcome to Business Line. U.S. President Donald Trump and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping met last week at Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort in Florida. It was the first face-to-face -face for the leaders of the world's two largest economies after a period of tension. Among the details of their talks that emerged after the two-day summit, the two leaders agreed to expand cooperation in various fields, including trade, infrastructure, energy and regional security. A significant outcome of the summit was an agreement for a 100-day plan for trade talks aimed at boosting U.S. exports and reducing China's trade surplus with Washington. After the meeting, the Chinese president said that there are a thousand reasons to make a China-U.S. relationship work and no reason to harm it. The two leaders also confirmed that they'll step up efforts to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. President Trump told the Sea that if China wants to work with the U.S., then Washington is ready to take unilateral action. Donald Trump chose his home turf, Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach, Florida, the so-called Winter White House, for his first meeting with the Chinese President Xi Jinping. The man for whom the deal is paramount says he told the Chinese leader that Beijing would get a better trade deal with Washington if it helped solve the U.S. problem with North Korea. That rogue state and its repeated missile tests was the most pressing issue. Pyongyang's recently fired off another ballistic missile following on from September's nuclear test. The international community retaliated with yet more sanctions. Trump wants the Chinese to do more to rein in Kim Jong-un's regime. Trump took to Twitter saying North Korea is behaving very badly. They've played the U.S. for years and China has done little to help. Washington wants Beijing to implement UN sanctions. The Chinese say that would devastate the North Korean economy and the population as 90% of its exports go to China. Beijing says it has stopped coal imports, which are the main source of Pyongyang's foreign exchange. The TAD anti-missile shield that the U.S. has recently set up in South Korea is another area of potential disagreement. The Chinese are unhappy about its deployment. They see it as a threat in their own backyard. The U.S. believes that that system will discourage North Korea from attacking its neighbor. Control of the South China Sea is another source of tension. Beijing lays claim to almost all of the potentially energy-rich South China Sea, rejecting the claims of its neighbours, and is at work enlarging some islands to host military installations. The Trump administration has yet to determine a policy on the issue. Obama deployed warships and aircraft in so-called freedom of navigation operations. And then there's trade, a problem for Trump, with tension created by his tough talk on trade during the election campaign. He slammed Beijing for its currency manipulation to favor exports and threatened massive tariffs on China if the U.S. fails to get adequate access to the Chinese market. That approach continued with aggressive tweets right before the Florida meeting. Since that summit, the two leaders have spoken by telephone and discussed tensions on the Korean peninsula, but Chinese officials have carefully avoided commenting about Trump's attempt to link trade with Beijing's help over North Korea. During his election campaign, Trump had pledged to stop what he's called the theft of American jobs by China. But the campaign is over, and Washington and Beijing now share a need for a stable relationship, despite their differences. The problem with the U.S.-China trade relationship is that it is highly unequal and has been for a long time. Last year, the U.S. shipped $116 billion worth of goods to China, making it the country's third largest export market after Canada and Mexico, according to the Department of Commerce. But that figure pales compared to the $463 billion in imports from China, mostly consumer items like clothing, electronics and machinery. The result is a U.S. trade deficit of $347 billion, the largest of any U.S. trading partner. Another big problem is China's currency, the yuan, which was not allowed to rise and fall based on global demand like those of other countries. 
As a result, the yuan remained artificially low, making Chinese exports cheaper and giving the country an unfair trading advantage. The International Monetary Fund has pressured China for years to let the market determine the value of its currency, rather than relying on artificial mechanisms. Trump described China's trade policy as rape. He threatened to impose a 45% tariff on Chinese imports and pledged to formally label the country a currency manipulator on his first day in the White House. He tweeted some months ago, Did China ask us if it was okay to devalue their currency, making it hard for our companies to compete? Heavily tax our products going into their country? The U.S. doesn't tax them. Or to build a massive military complex in the middle of the South China Sea? I don't think so. But China abandoned this policy in 2014 as it grappled with slower economic growth. In fact, now it's moving in the opposite direction. After slumping 6.5% against the dollar in 2016, the Chinese currency has risen by 0.7% so far this year. Trump vowed to address the trade imbalance through direct negotiations with China, rather than through multination deals or the World Trade Organization. President Barack Obama's policy was to try to strengthen the U.S. position in Asia, particularly with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the world's largest regional trade deal. Trump abandoned the TPP on his first day in office. That controversial trade agreement covered the U.S., Japan and 10 other Pacific Rim countries, but not China, in all about 40% of the global economy. The plan was to eventually create a new single market like that of the EU. Obama believed the TPP would be a counterweight to China's growing influence in the region. But U.S. opponents called it as a secretive deal that favored big business and other countries at the expense of American jobs and national sovereignty. The other countries involved could press ahead without the U.S. and its hundreds of millions of consumers. And ironically, Trump's withdrawal leaves the door now open for China to fill the gap. The U.S. withdrawal is a body blow to the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, but other nations involved are not about to abandon their commitment to free trade. Japan is the only country to have actually ratified the TPP. Having led the push for the partnership, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said he believed President Trump also recognizes the importance of free and fair trade. He told Parliament of his hopes to appeal to the Trump administration for their understanding of the TPP's strategic and economic significance. Abe's touted the deal as an engine of economic reform, as well as a counterweight to a rising China, which is not a member of the pact for now. New Zealand says that by pulling out, the U.S. is ceding influence to Beijing. Fellow pact member Australia has raised the prospect of China joining. Well, we, we want to have more opportunities with more markets. We already have a China-Australia free trade agreement. Uh, certainly there is the potential for China to join the TPP. One of the world's biggest multinational trade deals covering 40 percent of the world economy, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was signed by 12 member nations early last year after tough negotiations. Where it goes from here is far from clear. And finally, what about jobs? Trump has complained that U.S. companies moving manufacturing to cheap labor Chinese factories, where wages average around 80 percent less than in the U.S., has cost too many American jobs and that his policies will make America great again. The latest numbers are not that optimistic, though. In March, the U.S. created just 98,000 new jobs, the smallest gain in almost a year, less than half the monthly totals in January and February. And that's it for now. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you again next week.